why do you care about Rx? Um, Rx, it's, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the web is uh, very asynchronous. Look at this dictionary suggests, um, like when you type, there's events happening, uh, there's asynchronous calls to the server, and if you write a lot of these things together, your program gets pretty complicated quickly. You have all these nested callbacks, continuation passing, um, and Rx tries to address that. Um, so if you look at, for instance, at that sample, it does a queue up, starts an async XML HTTP request, and then it displays the results. In, you could uh, write it like this, and of course this is a very basic sample that is not very smart, not very well implemented, but this is like a good uh, first attempt. Like you, you, you hook up to the input key up in the event, and then you start an async a HTTP request, and once it comes back, you format the result at HTML. Well, it turns out that there's a couple more things that you have to worry about. First of all, you don't want to overload the server, so you try to tame the input on the client. You filter out the empty key ups from your text box, you filter out duplicates, uh, and you want to tame the input. If the user is typing and you know that he's going to type the second character for his completion in 10 milliseconds, it doesn't really make sense to send an asynchronous HTTP request to the server and put load on the server if the user is not, never going to see that value anyway. Um, and then there's this thing about ignoring old queries, and we'll get to that in a bit. And you need to expect failure. Web, there's big potholes in the, high, in the internet highway, so you need to expect failure everywhere. So let's look at that ignore old queries thing. So imagine that the user types the letter R in, in the dictionary suggest. Then the server sends out the response for the completions for the letter R. The user types the letter E. And now one of the servers is hit on your web farm that is a bit overloaded. So it's going to take a bit of time for this, this response to come back. Meanwhile, the user types the next character. And he happens to hit a server on your web farm that has plenty of time. He, uh, no, no load, so he immediately sends back a result and gives the completions for REA. Meantime, the busy server decides to wake up and send the response back for the completions or of RE. And now the user's UI is updated with an old completion. So that's pretty bad, and you don't want that to happen. Um, so the code that takes care of all the things that I just mentioned can look something like this. And this might not be the optimal way to do it, but this is like a good first attempt to write something like that. So we uh, hook up to the key up event, and um, we check if there's no error occurred in previous events. Then we check if there's a difference between the current value and the previous value. Um, and we, we save the, 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 pre the current value as a, the, for the next check. Then we set a timeout, because we only want to start sending the asynchronous request if the user hasn't typed anything for 250 milliseconds. So then this can also have an error because the timeout API could throw an error if you have too many timeouts in the queue. Um, then we continue. Uh, after 250 milliseconds has passed, we need to have a request ID to keep track of all the requests that happen uh, so that we can only use the last one that we were interested in to avoid that overlapping problem that we saw earlier. Um, then again, because we now have another asynchronous function, we need to check again if there's no errors occurred in this uh, whole call. And then finally, we get here, we can update the UI, and we need to check for errors in all these different cases. So all this taking care of errors and all the different parts of your asynchronous program can make your code pretty bulky and harder to understand. It's not immediately clear what the, the issue was that you were trying to solve here. So if we now look at Rx, and you look at our homepage, it, it has like a tagline like this. Rx is a library for composing asynchronous and event-based programs using observable collections. So let's dissect that sentence a bit. Asynchronous programming, as I just showed, is pretty hard right now. Um, so we want to see if we can make that better. We want to be able to compose events. We want to write a fluent API. So uh, you want to just be able to say, do this, and flow load by the next operation, the next operation. Instead of having to wrap your program inside out, which you have to do with continuation passing right now. And then last, mentions observable collections. Well, collections means that we can do queries, right? Like databases, it's all about collections. They're all flat tables, collections of data. So maybe we can do queries over these things as well then. So if you look at the Rx basic, um, 
we have looked at like a lot of existing asynchronous, asynchronous patterns, and all of them they signal some kind of completion when the thing that you asked it to do is done. Most of them also give you an error, and there's various ways that the different uh, APIs do this. Some they take two different sets of continuations. Some use the first uh, argument of the, the continuation to signal error or not, and then most of them have a payload as well. And this can either be a single payload in the case of an asynchronous call, or it can be many payloads in the case of an event like mouse move. So if you look at Rx, we came up with the following grammar. There is uh, zero or more messages, it's the payload, on next, followed by an optional uncompleted message or an on error message. And, and notice that these, uh, this can only be one. Um, but this is pretty mathematical, and I, I promise no mathematical stuff. So we're, we were going on the sliding path down here. So I want to do more math stuff. Um, so what's in the package? I'll dive in directly. So Rx ships with uh, two prototypes, observable and observer. And this is like the, the design pattern from uh, the Gang of Four from the 90s. Um, we have slightly modified it. So the subscribe, uh, just like in the design pattern takes an observer that wants to listen to that specific event stream or asynchronous stream. Uh, as you do notice, there's no unsubscribe. So what we did is, instead of having a separate unsubscribe method, we return you a method, a, a function, that when you call it, it will unsubscribe the whole computation. And the reason we do that is because we want you to allow you to compose all these events together. And if you have a whole chain of all these different events that you compose, you want to be able to unsubscribe them at a moment's notice by just making one call. So the thing that here returns, you call that, and the whole subscription will be torn down. Now, if you look at Observer, we split it into the three things that we mentioned in our grammar, on next, on error, and on completed. Um, so if you want to listen to these events, you just implement an Observer and implement these three methods. Um, and what we do is, by default, if you don't implement these two methods, on error will fire out the, it will just rethrow the exception, and on complete it will just be a no up. Uh, and then for ease of use, we also allow you to just pass in a function instead of having to create the observer object. Um, so that's the basic part of, of the, uh, the package. Of course, that doesn't have give that much additional value yet. The real value is in, in the lots of operators that we provide. Um, so we have a lot of conversions from existing JavaScript libraries. We have the, all the big ones, jQuery, Dojo, Prototype, MooTools, uh, YUI3. Um, and then we have a lot of manipulation operators. So we have projection, time-based operators, buffers. Um, so that's where the real value lies, the fact that you can combine multiple streams uh, and, and uh, modify the output. So let's uh, look at some key concepts that you need to know about observables before we start diving into the code. There's two kinds of observables. The first one is that we name uh, call observables. That means uh, like the, this one is like one of the most basic operators. It just creates an observable that when you call subscribe on it, it will return you the value 42. So you subscribe and your function or observer object will immediately be called with the value 42 followed by a call to uh, uncompleted. Um, the reason we call this call is because it doesn't happen until you actually ask it to do something. And that is in contrast with hot observables. So hot observables are things that will give events whether or not you're subscribed to it. Um, so for instance, any of the mouse move events or other events, uh, they just keep firing even if you don't subscribe to it. Of course, we optimize the way that you don't make all the calls, but it keeps firing in, in theory. So let's look at the most basic way of using Rx. So as I said, we integrate with jQuery. So we just load jQuery followed by loading Rx and then the specific jQuery bindings to Rx. Uh, we just use the regular jQuery selectors to get a DOM element, the input uh, element in this case. And then we say we want to subscribe to the, we want to convert the jQuery event key up to an observable. So this is an, an, a method that we added to the jQuery prototype. And now when you ask for the key up event, we'll hook up to the jQuery mechanism and give you a return you an observable object. 
and now you can use the subscribe to listen to it. Um, and of course, this you could easily do without uh, Rx, but this is just the most basic sample that shows how to start with Rx. Okay, so let's do some JavaScript hacking. Um, I figured that uh, IE didn't get much time today, so I'm going to do my demos with IE, even though it works in, in all the browsers. Um, okay, so I have here a simple page, just like, let me close a couple of these dialogues so you have some more real estate. So I have a, a simple web page. I load Rx jQuery and the J, Rx jQuery binding. Uh, and I have, let's show, scroll down. I have two elements, an, an input box and a diff to show the results. So I'm, I'm going to write the dictionary suggest sample using Rx. So I'm first going to hook up to the key up event from the input box. So I'm going to say input two observable of key up. And now I'm going to subscribe to that. Uh, sorry. And I'm going to pass the function what it needs to do when a value comes through. Uh, and I'm just for now going to put that in the results. So results in our HTML plus equals value. There. Okay, let's see what that does. And of course, I'm doing something wrong. Let's see if I refresh that. Demo effect. Mm. Okay, let's. Right Firefox. <laughs> Let me just change this to another word and see what I do wrong here. Right. Yeah, let's do something wrong with. Maybe I missed. Ah, oh, I know what I did wrong. I was using jQuery object to use in, in our HTML, and I should do in results.html value. There we go. And it still doesn't work. Results.html. Let's do this. That. Yes, there we go. Okay, so it gives me object object. Uh, and the reason for that is because the event gives me the, wind, the event object back. Um, so I don't want to use the whole event object. I'm really only interested in, in the value that's in the, in the text box. So I'm going to do a, a projection here. So uh, I'm going to say, instead of having this uh, event object in here, I want to have the value. So I'm going to select, and then I pass in a function value, return value dot source element dot value. There we go. So now when I refresh this, when I type, I get all the values. Of course, now when I do arrows, uh, oh, sorry. so now when I uh, copy and paste the same thing in, it displays the same value. Um, and when I do empty, it also shows that. So I want to filter out those events. So first I'm going to filter out the empty case. So if value is not the empty string, I want to send this through. So now it doesn't fire the empty case. And if I want to have the unique values, there's an operator that's called distinct until changed. It's like a distinct in a database. The only difference is that because these observable streams can be potentially infinite, it doesn't keep a cache of all the values that it's seen previously. It only keeps a cache of the, the last value it saw. So if you type a and then A again, it will not fire A, but if you type B afterwards and then A again, it will fire the A again at a later time. There we go. Okay, so that's working now. It's hard to see, I guess. Um, so now we have the, the input that we want. Uh, there's only one thing that we still wanted to add, is we wanted to make sure that we don't fire unless the user hasn't typed for a couple of sec uh, milliseconds. So I'm going to say, let me throttle the user's input here. So throttle for 250 milliseconds. I need to insert a dot here. 
Okay, so let's give this a try. So if I type A, B, C, it shows up, but I didn't show the A and the B in the min meantime. Okay, so we have tamed our input. Let's uh, go make an asynchronous request. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say select for every value that comes in. Make an XMITSP request, and we have a, a wrapper around the, uh, the XHR as well. So I'm going to say rx.observable.xml HTTP request and download that from 1.8.4.2.8000. Query, the query is, and I'm just going to escape the value here. And I believe I need to do one more. Let's see. I need Okay, let's give that a try. And I made an error. Let's see. Yes, well, that's right. Yep. Sorry? Oh, yes, you're right. I tapped that way too big. And there's still more errors. Uh, of course, I need to return that value. I'm not using coffee script. Okay, <laughs> um, so now we get an object back, which is the XML HTTP request. Um, so there was one thing that we still needed to do because now I just make an XML HTTP request for every value that comes in, and I just said that that was bad because now you can have this overlapping results problem. So let's go fix that. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the switch operator, and the switch operator switches between all the new observables as the moment it comes in. So uh, I'm going to type switch, and while we're at it, I'm going to change this to change the to use the response text here. There we go. And there. This is a 1913 dictionary, so it's uh, it's not that uh, fancy, but uh, it was the, the one I could find that didn't have any license issues. <laughs> okay, so we have our dictionary suggest working. So let's look a bit more into what we just did with all these operators. Um, so let's start with the, the more basic operator. Uh, so what we often do is uh, to explain all our operators is we draw these things that we call marble diagrams. So this is the code for the marble diagram, and then we show each of the observables here, where we usually show the inputs on top and the, the output on the bottom. And this shows time, um, that direction, and then we project the values how they go from the input to the output stream. So select what it does, it, it, it gets called for each value that comes through, each on next message, and the user gets a chance to transform each single value. Um, so in this case, we did the event source element dot value. So it goes from the event object to the value of the data. And it does this as long as there just messages come in until a completed message comes in. And the completed message is just sent through directly. It doesn't carry any value. Um, of course, errors could happen. And these could happen in two places. They can either be errors that already existed in the source uh, observable or they could be introduced by the user here in, in, the, in the selector function. Uh, we try to use abort semantics where possible, so we send these errors straight through. Uh, there's no manipulation on them. Um, distinct until changed, uh, as I said, it, it starts producing all the values through. If it has that value in its cache currently, it doesn't send it through, uh, so the second value didn't get projected down. Then a new different value came in, it gets sent through, um, until a new value comes in and completed gets sent through direct directly. Uh, and then I, I think you can also pass in a comparer function if you want to do more complex comparisons than just uh, equality comparison. Okay, throttle. Um, throttle is a bit more interesting operator because it does time shifting. Um, so uh, it, the first time the user types a character, um, it starts a timer, and if the next message doesn't come in when the timer times out, it will fire it out. So in this case, there was not a second elapsed before the second value came in. 
so it ignored the first value. And then after a second, no new message came in, so it projects the second value. Um, the moment it gets completed, it actually sends it out the moment that the last value has sent out, been sent out. Um, and that's important because like, if an error happens, we're trying to use abort semantics. So even though there is a value outstanding, if an error comes through, we say, oh, this thing has to be aborted. So we send the error right through, and the, the, the one that was in flight will never get sent out. OK, switch. So a switch uh, looks a lot more complicated. Um, you just have to wrap your mind around it a bit, and then it will flow automatically how it should work. So what we did in our sample is that we selected from a value to a new observable. So what we actually created was an observable which payload, it again, are observables themselves. So each value that comes through in that original observable is itself an observable. So what we, we can do is we can subscribe to these and project them out in a flattened way. So every time a new observable comes in, we start listening to it, and all values get projected down immediately. The moment that on our outer observable, a new message comes through with the next observable, we unsubscribe from the first observable, and then we start listening to the second observable and project each value through. So the, even though this one had more values, we just ignore them. If this one happens to be completed before our outer produces a new one, we just wait until the outer one to give our new values. And then we complete when both the outer and the last inner have both a completed message. So this is exactly solving that issue with uh, having XML HTTP requests coming out of order. OK, so error semantics uh, get a bit more tricky because now there's much more places where errors can happen. Um, so errors can happen inside the inner observable or inside the outer observable. Uh, in both cases, we just use abort semantics. OK, so um, Rx is a, a general purpose library. Um, it works not only on websites. And I, I want to show you that that's the case. Um, so this virtual machine is actually running Node. And um, what we did is I wrote a couple of wrappers around Node to use uh, create Rx bindings, observable bindings, for each of the asynchronous operations. So I'll quickly show you how that looks like. Yeah. So instead of requiring sys and HTTP and FS, uh, I require Rx sys and Rx HTTP. And what we just did is we, we exported all the original functions, but then with a, an Rx wrapper. So I create HTTP server just like uh, the normal package. But then what I do is I want to get the parsed URL instead of the uh, the, um, the just a string URL. So I select in with a select the, the URL parse version of it so that I can look at the query. And then as my dictionary only works on alphanumeric, uh, uh, sorry, alpha uh, strings, I make sure that the query is an, al uh, an, an alphabetic character. And so my observable now only contains URL requests that, uh, that are valid. And then I do a select many. So select many is like bind in Haskell. I don't know for people who know that. Uh, what it does, it gives you an opportunity to replace each value of a observable with a function, uh, sorry, with a new observable that is then flattened. So in this case, um, I get the request in, and then I'm going to start an async read file request um, so I read that file, and when, the, uh, when that value comes through, I select the JSON. And then in the end, I just subscribe to my event and send the response out. There. So as you can see, it's not just for website. It runs in any environment that runs JavaScript. Um, there's a lot more operators in Rx than I just covered in this small talk. Um, there's a lot of time-based operators, buffer operators, um, there's aggregation operators, uh, there's uh, operators to convert from existing events, um, there's mechanism to create your own observables. 
So it's a, it's a pretty extensive package. And the download, the, the, the core of Rx is 7K gzip. Um, and there's a whole bunch of extra libraries for the integrations that are all separate, so you don't have to pay for the download size. If, like if you don't use Dojo but jQuery, you, you don't want to pay for the download size of the, the, the Dojo bindings. Um, so what's next? Um, you can find Rx on the following URL, and it's a pretty crappy URL, so just type it in your favorite search engine, and it should show up. Uh, we do a new release about every two to five weeks. Um, we have a, a web forum that you can report bugs, feature su suggestions, uh, just help on how to implement things. Uh, we have a lot of videos online. Um, I think we have about 40 videos right now, and we post new ones every couple of weeks. Uh, and then there's also uh, two Twitter channels. Um, we wanted to use pound our, our hash Rx, but yeah, there's a lot of stuff there already that you don't want to read. <laughs> so uh, we're using RxJS and RxNet. And you can also just uh, look at, at my uh, Twitter feeds. And with that, uh, I'd like to open it up for questions. Yeah. I had a question. So that last example that you showed, did you get a node running on Windows? Uh, no, I didn't try. I just. So that's a VM? Yeah, so this, a was, this is a Linux VM. Uh, I, just, uh, I just did uh, app get and uh, got it going. What was the licensing? Uh, so the licensing is a uh, it's a custom license, but it's it's a pretty much as is license. Um, it's not officially supported through product support right now, but you can use it in your applications as you want. Um, it, we had just switched this Thursday before we had to have like an installer, which was really painful if you're not on the Windows platform. And the the release that we did this Thursday, it's now in a zip file. Uh, so it's very easy to get on any platform. Yep. Not exactly a question, but uh, the comments, perhaps, that those marble diagrams are actually pretty cool. I was just kind of searching around. Actually, the top search hit for marble diagram is the reactive framework. But I was just curious, there are other projects. I imagine it's all, everyone uses it, Microsoft, all behind the scenes. But mm -hmm. curious if there are other it seems like that should be something that other projects should. Yeah, it should be some, anything that's asynchronous can can benefit from this. It seems like there's like UML would be like the default place to go and look mm -hmm. at these kind of diagrams. I don't know if this was like inspired by some other. Is there another UML-ish vocabulary word? I don't know. We we came up with this when we like we needed to draw these things and like hmm, how can we explain to people what the behavior of these uh, operators is and just this came naturally. Okay. It's similar to like a client server diagram, right? Mm -hmm. Where you yeah. have the two lines of time going down the side, mm -hmm. make requests back and forth. Yep. So, uh, which is typically called a Stevens diagram. Stevens from the networking book. Okay. This seems yeah. less dogmatic and just useful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I, I, I uh, still want to invest. So, one of the things that is still lacking is documentation. Like we are a small team. We are three developers plus one architect. Um, so, as you know, documentation always lags behind. So, one of the things like I have about 1,500 tests for Rx. And I want to generate these marble diagrams automatically. So I hope that that will help improve the documentation. Cool. Any other questions? Um, is, are, I've been doing quite a bit of sim a, a similar, a project in a similar vein based off of uh, Tyler Close's promises from the Packer. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of them? Is there a connection a distinction? So there's, a lot of reactive programming going on, and um, they're all good packages. The, the thing that we did is we really looked at like the the, the monads and uh, from from functional programming, and used that as our basis. Um, I, I have not seen how how they base their programming. Yeah, there's. Uh, but it, it's interesting. I took a very similar approach. The, the promise life is usually called Q locally as an event queue. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. It does. It is uh, addressing a similar. Uh, it's less about streaming events and subscriptions and more about the about return results. Mm -hmm. It seems like there might be some connection. Okay, I'll, I'll look into that. I've, I've not had a chance to look into it. And I'll, and I'll look into this as well. So. Okay, good. Well, thank you for your time.